All right. Congratulations again to all of you. And uh, please do pick up a copy of Acts and Facts. It's an excellent uh, edition. Comes out quarterly. Lots of wonderful uh, articles in here that are just such faith encouragers that we have a creator God who is sovereign over all the universe. Now, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to that passage that I read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 12. It's a very important section. This is actually, your bulletin is wrong. Uh, it should be part seven, not part eight. But uh, listen carefully or die. That was the plague of the death of the firstborn, the last of the ten plagues, just before the exodus out of Egypt. God doing some incredible, powerful things. We find that this is mentioned and referenced. In fact, all of the plagues are mentioned and referenced in many other parts of the Bible, including the New Testament. And those of you who have been with us over this entire series know how often and how frequently God gives his word in different contexts but refers back to the exodus and to the plagues. The plagues we've seen so far, the plague of blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of lice, the plague of flies, the plague of murrain or the cattle plague, boils, hails, locusts, darkness, and now we're in that final plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn. And you remember, I've given you a little, what we call a budak, a little mnemonic device, so that you can remember all 10 of the plagues. By taking the first syllable out of each one of them, if you memorize that weird little chain of odd sounds, you can remember all 10 plagues in their correct order. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, halo, and daddy. I'm going to give you guys a test on this. You know, when I, when I get actually, when they're actually across the Red Sea, I'm going to give you a test. I'm going to pass out some papers here. I'm going to see who can write it down and you put your name on the paper and you cannot cheat, you cannot look over to somebody else, you cannot look at your notes, okay? <laughs> and who knows whether or not there might be some prizes for people who can remember the ten plagues. If by this time you can't remember the ten plagues, there is no hope for you! <laughs> okay, let's say them together. Blow fro, lie fly, moo bo, halo. Daddy. Okay. Here we are. Now, it's been a while since we've been there in the plagues because December 13th was the last time we talked about it. That was part six. The 20th, of course, was Christmas Sunday, and I spoke on the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Then December 27th, I was in Alabama, and so uh, we had a guest speaker, Keith McCoy. So now we're back to our Exodus part seven, chapter 12, verses one through 20. And you recall that last time that we were together on the 13th for this study, we looked and saw that there was a very interesting connection between Moses and Elijah, the key figures of the Passover, as a matter of fact. Moses, of course, we know Elijah, all the Jews today set a place for Elijah at the Passover Seder table because they know that Malachi has prophesied that Elijah would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And we saw that both Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw it in the Gospel of Matthew. And then last time, we also looked at the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 9 connects us to the Passover, to Moses, to Elijah, and to the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ, where he makes a promise that there would be some that were standing there who would see him coming in glory, which is what took place at the Transfiguration. Take your Bibles and turn back to Mark chapter 9 for just a moment so that we can have some background as to where we're going today. Mark 9, beginning in verse 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, as so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Uh, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. 
Brady wist not what to say, though he was always ready to say something, for they were so afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly, when they looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. Now, as we've looked at these two passages and as we looked at the history of rabbinic thought, on the subject of Elijah preceding the coming of the Messiah. Why are the Jews not able to see the truth when it is so plain, at least to us as believers in this New Testament era? And we began our study on the 13th of what's called judgmental blindness. Their hearts have been blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, the Apostle Paul tells us. But even though they're now in blindness, God has not cast Israel away. God, in fact, inspired an entire chapter in the book of Romans to declare his faithfulness to national Israel. That's a pretty powerful declaration in one of the most powerful books of the New Testament. Romans chapter 11, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is obviously talking about Jews, not the church. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture says of Elias? <laughs> Here we are, back to Elijah again. Remember, Moses and Elijah, Passover, Transfiguration, prophecies concerning the first coming, prophecies concerning the second coming. It's all being tied together in a bundle here. How he maketh intercession against Israel. He doesn't make intercession against the church. Elijah did not preach against the church. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. An election of of grace, and he's been talking about Israel. There's a remnant still alive who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, who have not kowtowed to the secularism of the world around them. A remnant. And it's of grace. And if it be by grace, then it is no more of works. In other words, they're not getting saved by the law. The grace of God is going to reach down to them. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And I need to pause here just to make a comment. We see the grace of God overwhelmingly at work, even under the period of the law. God is always a gracious God, even though he is a righteous God, which is what is portrayed by the law. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were, listen to it carefully, blinded. That's a judgmental blindness that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 11. Is it permanent? Well, Paul gave us a hint at the very beginning of that chapter. He said, God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew, because there is still a remnant left of them. According as it in verse 8 now, Romans 11, 8, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. God is the one who sends judgmental blindness. 
God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear until this day. And by the way, that's a quotation out of Isaiah chapter 29, verse 10. And that is a statement of the judgment of God in Isaiah against Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is called Ariel, Lion of God. Arie is the word for lion. El is the shortened form of Elohim, God. That's the name that's given to the city of Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 29. And then we get to verse 9, and we find Paul quotes David in the Psalms. And David saith, this is from Psalm 69, 22, and 23, and always look in the Old Testament for quotes. When you see some dark type in your New Testament, or italicized type that's been bold-faced, say, hey, that might be a quotation from the Old Testament. Look for it. Look it up. Look at its context. You can learn so much by the way in which the apostles quote the Old Testament. And David saith, this is that quotation out of Psalm 69, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. It's amazing how many times the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. For example, verse 25 in Psalm 69, just two verses later, is quoted by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, as a prophecy about Judas going out and hanging himself. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. In other words, he's going to quote the Old Testament. God keeps his word literally and accurately and precisely. We don't have to allegorize it. We don't have to mythologize it. We don't have to explain it away. God says what he means, and he means what he says, and he does not stutter when he speaks. Sometimes I do. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. You and I might study scripture for a long time before we ever figured that one out. But God made it very clear because Peter was speaking under the moving and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to apply that to what happened to Judas. Now back to Romans 11, the judgmental blindness. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now, Paul's asking a rhetorical question here. Have they, that is Israel, stumbled that they should fall? In other words, is God done with them? Is he over with them? Is he through with them? Are they finished? What is the purpose that God had in the fall of national Israel? What was the purpose for the judgment after the cross where in 70 A.D. Titus came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and threw down all the stones like Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 24? What was God's purpose in that? What was the purpose of God in their failure to remember the true meaning of Passover that Christ would be their Passover lamb? What is the purpose of God in Israel's failure to understand and apply the teaching nature of the law that salvation is not through the law? Condemnation comes through the law. Well, Paul answers his question. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, now here's the purpose, that through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Dear people, if you're a Gentile, and I think most of us here are, if you're a Gentile, God had a purpose in allowing Israel to reject their Messiah. He was going to bring chastening upon them. He was going to give them some judgmental blindness, but it was not going to be permanent. But during that time of judgmental blindness, God was going to use the gospel of Christ to reach Gentiles, those of us who are lost outside the fold, outside the covenants and promises of God. God was going to use their fall to take his word and reach those who were outside the pale. And that's us. Oh, the grace of God. And Paul concludes that way in this passage. We'll read it in just a moment. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, indeed it has been, 
and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. Oh, I love this last phrase. How much more their fullness. Think about it. If when they fell, you and I receive this kind of blessing, what blessing will we receive when God brings them back to himself as a nation? That's Paul's argument here. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that is other Jews, and might save some of them. Listen to verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Powerful argument Paul is making. In other words, it's crazy for a Christian to be anti-Semitic. We received incredible blessings through their fall, and we will receive even greater blessings through their restoration. Why should we stick up our noses as God blesses them and returns them to their rightful land that he promised to Abraham? Oh, there are so many replacement theologians today who talk about Christian Palestinianism and twist the promises and covenants of God and reject God sovereignly drawing Jews from all over the world back to their land, a land which has not been Israel for 2,000 years, and yet in a land born in a day as prophesied in the Old Testament in 1948. A land born in a day, surrounded by enemies that outnumbered them 200 to 1. And God has enabled them to win every war since then. But there's coming a day when Israel will be put on the burner so hot that they will no longer be able to trust in themselves. They will have to cry out, as Hosea tells us, have to cry out for the Messiah, and God will deliver them. Christ will return. God has not forgotten his covenant promises. If he forgets his covenant promises to Israel, it means he'll forget his covenant promises to you. Remember that. If God lied to Israel, it means he's lied to you. But we have a God who cannot lie. A God who guarantees what he promises. His name is at stake. You recall what happened in the days of Hezekiah when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent Rav Shaka, his general, and all the Assyrian troops to Jerusalem. And they surrounded Jerusalem. And they said, don't let Hezekiah trick you into thinking that God's going to deliver you. After all, where are all the gods of these other nations which we have destroyed? We'll destroy your God too. And Isaiah took that scroll and he laid it out before the Lord in the temple. And God said to him, said through Isaiah the prophet, he says, You tell him that the way that the Assyrians came by that same way they return. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and killed 186,000 Assyrian troops. And the army withdrew. And they went back to Nineveh. And Sennacherib, the king, who had blasphemed the God of heaven, was worshiping before Nisroch, his own God. And as he was at the feet of his own God, who he said was so powerful, his two sons from his own loins, Edrem, Melech, and Sherezer, came in and killed him. What powerful God was that? Can't even protect the king while the king is worshiping him. God always defends his name. God always keeps his covenants. God always fulfills his promises. Judgmental blindness is followed by God's mercy in keeping covenant with the Jewish people. So today we want to add some new material that expands on that theme which brings us full circle to the ultimate meaning and application of the Passover and the final plague of death of the firstborn when God delivered Israel from Egypt. In this chapter that we've just read, Paul ties eight key doctrines that stem from Christ fulfilling the typology of the Passover lamb. Romans 11, 
that great chapter dealing with predestination and election, and that's what we normally think of it as, Romans 9, 10, and 11, doctrines of predestination, doctrines of election. In chapter 11, Paul ties eight key doctrines together that stem from Christ fulfilling the typology of the Passover lamb, which is what we're studying in Exodus chapter 12. You see, it's foundational for all kinds of doctrines when we get to the New Testament. We find stated here in this passage the remnant principle, number one. You heard me read it just a moment ago. God always saves out a remnant. Number two, the doctrine of judgmental blindness. Doc, number three, chastening and the loss of rewards. Four, which is often confused when we look at the passages dealing with chastening, the doctrine of eternal security. The Arminians go in and they look at those passages that deal with chastening and say, ah, loss of salvation. No, Paul talks about both of those here in this chapter, that there is chastening and loss of rewards, but he also states that there is eternal security. We also find in this passage, restoration of blessing for repentance. Oh, how important that is. God is not only a God of judgment, God is not only a God of chastening, but God is a God of mercy. And God always restores blessing when we come to him in repentance. Number six, there is the guaranteed future in the land of promise for national Israel. That's clearly stated in this passage. Number seven, the permanent nature of the covenants of God. People think that God makes promises that he doesn't keep. This passage tells us the permanent nature of the covenants of God. And then Paul closes with the spiritual gifts and the grace of God. Verses 16 through 36 deal with the interconnection of all eight of those doctrines. Verse 16 and following, he says, If the first roots be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. Who is the root? Christ is the root. There are branches that grow out from the root. And he talks about two different kinds of branches. And if some, now remember the remnant principle back in verse 5, if some of the branches were broken off, that is, the Jews were broken off. And thou, being a wild olive tree, you're the Gentiles, were grafted in among them. So here's a branch gets broken off. Slit is made in the tree. A wild olive branch is grafted in to that same stock. The root is Christ. We're grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Now here's the warning. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. <laughs> what keeps the branch alive? Does the branch keep itself alive and keep the root alive, or does the root keep the branch and its fruit alive? Thou wilt say, here we are getting arrogant, us Gentiles. The branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Ha, 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 ha. That's a very sassy, arrogant, wise mouth answer. Paul says in verse 20, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. He's writing to believers. He's writing to the church at Rome, one of the mature churches. One of the most powerful epistles in the New Testament. Be not high-minded, but fear. Don't you go bragging about how you as Gentiles got grafted in because Israel got broken off. Unfortunately, a lot of churches today that are like that. In other words, God can send judgmental blindness on you too. Just because you're part of the church does not mean that you are exempt from the very heavy, painful hand of the Father when he chastens his children. Verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, that's Israel, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. In other words, don't get so wrapped up in a proud, one-sided view of eternal security, which is a very true doctrine that you forget the doctrine of the chastening hand of God. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but on thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, notice something. Just like eternal security, when Israel was cut off, it was not permanently cut off, but only temporarily to teach them a lesson. Verse 23, and they also, if they bide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. 
He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about Jews and, and Gentiles, which will all be part of that same root at some point when they trust Christ. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature, into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? tree. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Mystery is not something that's secret and mystical and you can't figure it out. A mystery is, according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, is something that God did not reveal to the, apostle, to the prophets in the Old Testament, but has now in these days revealed unto the apostles and prophets by his spirit. A mystery is a new revelation of the plan of God. There are 17 of them in the New Testament. We've talked about that before. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now you're starting to get arrogant and haughty and proud and anti-Semitic, knee-jerk attitude. That blindness in part, not in full, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall all Israel be saved. And you know that's promised in the Old Testament, Psalm 14:7. Psalm 53, verse 6, as it is written, it's written in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 20 and 21, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God made a covenant with Israel. He promised that the day was coming when Israel as a nation would turn to him. A day in which he would take away their sins. It's going to take the Great Tribulation to do it. Israel's going to have to go through the worst period of suffering that they've ever had in their entire history. The Holocaust and the Russian pogroms and the Polish pogroms and the persecutions they've suffered in South America and in China. And yes, even here some in the United States. There's coming a day even worse than the Babylonian captivity, worse than the Assyrian captivity, Worse than the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. There is coming a day when Israel will finally turn to Jesus Christ and call out for the Messiah. Their eyes will be opened. The judgmental blindness will be removed. The veil will be taken away when the law of Moses is read. They will cry out for him to deliver them. And he will. Oh, I pray for my friends in Israel every day. Dear, dear young people back when I was there who could quote major portions of Hebrew scriptures, but they couldn't understand it. I pray that they will trust Christ. It is their only hope. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. He's clearly talking about Jews, not the church. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God never removes his calling or his grace. The word translated gifts here is charis, the word from which we get our word for spiritual gifts that God sovereignly gives. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Remember, that's where we started this passage. What was the purpose of having Israel fall? It was not to permanently cast them away, but so that the door to the Gentiles could be opened up so that you and I might come to Christ. And so he goes back to that now. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Do you understand that? Do you understand the implications? Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying that our job as Gentiles is to reach the Jews with the gospel of Christ. Verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, as you see it from God's perspective, this is why Paul ends with his paean of praise. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. Nobody, obviously. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. That temporary judgmental blindness of Israel is also stated in 2 Corinthians. And by the way, notice the context of 2 Corinthians here. It takes us back to the Passover. It takes us back to the Exodus. It takes us back to Mount Sinai. It takes us back to the giving of the law. It takes us back to the Shekinah glory appearing. You see, those things are foundational for major doctrinal sections of the New Testament. Notice what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But if the ministration of death, what he, does he call the ministration of death? Listen to what he calls the ministration of death. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones. Now what do you know that was written and engraven in stone? <laughs> Ten Commandments, you're right. If that was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, you know, when you read, and we'll be getting to those passages, uh, Lord willing, in a few weeks, when you read about the giving of the law at Mount Sinai and how they had to surround the mountain with a barricade and that if even an animal so much as touched the mountain, it was to be killed, and the mountain smoked and quaked and there was thunder and lightning and a huge cloud came down on the mountain and Moses went up into the cloud and talked with God. And the children of Israel were fearful and they ran away. If that was glorious... And that was called the ministration of death. That's the law, folks. The law will not justify you. The law will not sanctify you. Keeping the law will not save you, for all have sinned. You've all broken the law, and so have I. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law was the ministration of death. Don't put yourself back under the law. It was a schoolmaster designed to bring you to Christ, to show you that you could not match up to the requirements of a holy God. Paul tells us in Galatians, it's a schoolmaster. The one who beats the kid until he learns the lesson. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We had to call on Christ for his mercy, for his grace, that he paid the penalty for our sins on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose again. A schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. How much shall not the ministration of the Spirit, ah, the ministration of death versus the ministration of the Spirit, be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, that's the ministration of death, that's the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. And notice if you compare in things, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For example, we had our um, New Year's Eve watch night service and had a very nice dinner. And uh, at the dinner, someone brought a, a whole tray of cupcakes, commercial cupcakes, and each one of them had a little plastic ring in the cupcake, on the top of the cupcake, with some cartoon smiley face on it. And, you know, those are exciting things for little kids. I mean, boy, that, that's really cool to have a plastic ring with a smiley face on it. <laughs> I gave mine to a couple little kids. Um, <laughs> I don't need one of those. Like an attractive bubblegum ring is admired by kids, but it has no glory at all if you compare it to the Hope Diamond. You heard of the Hope Diamond? Magnificent, glorious, fantastic, gigantic diamond. It may be glorious when you look at it and that's all you've ever seen is a plastic bubblegum ring. But when you put that next to the Hope Diamond, it has no glory at all. And that's how Paul compares the law with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and the death of Christ on the cross, fulfilling all of the law so that all you have to do is place your faith in him alone and he gives you as a gift eternal life. Is that glorious? Oh my, that is so much more glorious than even the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. For if that which is done away was glorious, and that's the law, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And that's the glory of the glory of Christ revealed by the Holy Spirit. 
Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses. We're back, you see, at the Exodus, at the giving of the law, at Mount Sinai. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now here's the judgmental blindness, verse 14. But their minds were blinded. Takes us back to that same theme. Takes us back to what's going on at the Exodus. Takes us to that night of darkness and the plague of darkness where they couldn't even see their hand in front of their face, but there was light in the dwellings of the Egyptians all night long. Uh, of the Israelites. The Egyptians couldn't move from their places. It was a darkness that it says could be felt. It was that dark. They didn't even dare get up out of their chairs. But there was light, the Shekinah glory, in the dwelling of the Israelites all night long as the Passover was going on. As the wailing began to take place all over the land of Egypt, there was light in the dwelling of the Israelites. But there was blindness, a judgmental blindness in the rest. But then there came a judgmental blindness to Israel when they rejected Christ. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, that is their heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. God peels back the veil, and what does he reveal? Christ. Christ. Their Messiah. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <laughs> what do the Jews celebrate at Passover? Liberty. Freedom from the bondage of the slavery of Egypt. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I say judgmental blindness. How does God accomplish that? And does he only do it to unbelievers or does he sometimes do it to believers? Well, the very next chapter in 2 Corinthians tells us who is the instrument that God uses to cause judgmental spiritual blindness. Not what, but who. Who is the instrument that God uses to cause judgmental spiritual blindness? Chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now listen, here's the judgmental blindness. He's going to be talking about it. But if our gospel be hid, it's covered, they can't see it. It is hid to them that are lost. So we're talking about unbelievers here, at least at the beginning. In whom, now here is the instrument in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who's the God of this world? Scripture describes him for us. He's our adversary, the devil. God uses Satan as an instrument of judgmental blindness. The Bible gives clear illustration of that. We're not going to have time for it today to go all the way through it. But I'll give you the passage. We'll cover it next week, the Lord willing. But God, did you realize that God sent a lying spirit into the mouth of false prophets in 1 Kings chapter 22? We find the angelic beings gathering before the throne of God. And the question is raised, who's going to go down and, you know, cause King Ahab to lose this battle? And one of the spirits shows up and says, look, I'll do it. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. God says, that'll work. God sends him. Ahab loses because he believes the false prophets. We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, next week. Did you know also that God not only uses judgmental blindness, and that's a very long passage, it's uh, over 40 verses long. Did you know that God uses Satan as an instrument of judgmental blindness against Christians too. Christians who refuse to obey the word of God. Christians who insist on walking in carnality. Christians who insist on living in immorality. 
Christians who insist on being stubborn and rebellious and recalcitrant? Oh, there's much more. But that's also a God of mercy. He has not cast Israel away forever. There is eternal security. He will not cast you away forever, even if he chastens you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all the partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, you're not legitimate children of the Father. Because God always chastens his own children, that they may be partakers of his holiness. We'll have to stop there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. For its beauty, for its comprehensiveness. How we thank you for the eternal covenants of God, which are always amen and true. How we thank you that you never break a promise. That you're the God who does not lie. That you're a God who made covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And with the twelve tribes of Israel and you gave them a land and you promised them that you would bring them back. You've taken them out three times and you're in the process of bringing them back the third time. You promised that the day is coming when even though they come back now in unbelief, the day is coming when they will have to cry out to you. They will have no more resources of their own. They will cry out for Jesus, the Messiah, to rescue them. And he will. Because you're a God who keeps promise. How we thank you, Father, that this temporary blindness that they are now experiencing, this judgmental blindness, has been the opening of the gospel for the Gentiles so that we might be saved. How much more when you restore them those who are the rightful branches of the olive tree. Oh, what blessing that will bring. Father, help us to understand that in your sovereign plan, you're not merely a God of judgment, not merely a God of the law, but you're a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God who loves us so much that you sent Jesus, your son, to die in our place. Father, how we thank you for your word. Take it and apply it to each one of our hearts, we pray. Through the blood of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 581.